the reading of scripture. Our scripture comes today from Romans 8, 28, and 37 through 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, Tim. Bow for just a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for this time, this moment. Speak to our hearts, open our eyes and our ears. Reveal your heart to us, I pray. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been dealing with a short series called Half Truths Won't Make You Whole. So I want to deal with one this morning. This will be the final one. Has anyone ever said to you, everything happens for a reason? Anybody said that? Okay. Or after some particularly painful event in your life, maybe somebody said, you will have to accept that this was God's will for you. Or anything like that. Well, that's the half-truth I want us to look at this morning. And it's a particularly difficult one to deal with because it impinges on one of the deepest theological questions that has existed for centuries and has been debated at great length. In fact, two of the biggest questions are in this particular question, but the pro- or particular statement. The problem of evil and suffering is one of the big ones, and the other one is the sovereignty of God being in control and how much free will do we have. Those are the two big questions. And both of them impinge in this statement. And we're not going to solve that debate that's been going on for centuries in a 20-minute sermon. But let's give it our best shot, okay? When we say everything happens for a reason, that statement holds some truth if we mean that we live in a world of cause and effect. That actions create consequences. That our own choices produce Results. A result of choosing, for instance, to text while driving may be a collision that happens where somebody else is injured or even killed. But usually, when we say everything happens for a reason, we aren't talking about cause and effect. Most often, we're speaking in response to suffering. When something bad has happened and we're trying to help somebody through a difficult time, we say it was meant to be. When somebody dies unexpectedly, sometimes we hear it must have been their time, or it was part of the plan, or it must have been God's will. Everything happens for a reason. I'm going to encourage you this morning. If you've ever said that to somebody, don't ever say it to them again. Please. Such thoughts might be comforting in times like back in 2016 when my 90-year-old mother died suddenly while sitting in a rocking chair doing a crossword puzzle. I, I could take some comfort in feeling like this was her time to go and be with her father in heaven. But when somebody's lost a child to death, or just found out they have cancer, or just lost their job unexpectedly, or just gone through a devastating flood uh, that wiped out everything they owned, it's not particularly helpful to tell them it must have been God's will, or everything happens for a reason. I'll tell you biblically why that's not a good idea. If you remember the story of Job in the Bible, And if you don't, I don't have time to go through the whole story. But his friends made this same mistake. They thought Job must have done something really bad 
to cause all of his suffering. That God was only giving him what he deserved. And that he needed to search his heart to find out what he had done to cause all of this. Why did they think that? Well, because, as you know, everything happens for a reason. But if you remember, God wasn't happy with those friends. <laughs> Not at all. In his book, Ten Dumb Things That Smart Christians Believe, Larry Osborne describes how this very half-truth impacted his life when his wife was diagnosed with cancer. And in trying to encourage them, many of the people at their church tried to tell them how her cancer was an essential part of God's great and wonderful plan for their life. And Larry said that they never knew quite how to respond to that. If, if this was God's best, then He could save it for somebody else. Quote, he said, we were willing to take a pass. We also noticed that none of those who were so quick to proclaim it a blessing seemed very eager to get blessed the same way in their own life. Their words varied, but the message was always the same. Someday, you'll be glad this happened. They were told many things, such as God must be up to something. God doesn't make mistakes. You must be very special for God to trust you with this. Won't it be great to see how God uses this? Isn't it good that everything happens for a reason? Here's the half-truth. In one sense, the people who said those things were absolutely right. No matter what happens, God is in charge. He is king of the universe. And He's good. But listen to this. That does not mean that God is the direct cause of everything that happens. It doesn't mean that everything that happens is something He even wants to happen. And it certainly doesn't mean that everything He allows to happen is good. Let me give, I mean, think about it. God didn't cause Lucifer to rebel. God didn't cause Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. God didn't cause David to sleep with Bathsheba. God didn't kill Abel. He didn't build the Tower of Babel. He didn't force the crowd to cry out for Barabbas instead of Jesus when he was crucified. He didn't coerce the Roman soldiers into killing Jesus. Those were carried out by, uh, those evil deeds were carried out by people who bear full responsibility for their actions. They can't blame God. I mean, Adam tried the very beginning when they sinned. When he was confronted in the garden, he said, that woman that you gave me. <laughs> it's her fault. It's your fault. It's not my fault. But it didn't fly, did it? You can look it up. So where do we get this idea anyway? We get it because Scripture teaches the sovereignty of God, that He is in control over the world, over the entire universe. But Scripture also teaches the free will of humans. That's the big question, isn't it? If God is in control, and if we have free will, how exactly does that work? And that's part of the mystery, isn't it? And of all the Scriptures, perhaps Romans 8.28 has been the one most often cited to back up an idea that everything happens for a reason. And much of the confusion regarding this verse can be traced to the way the verse was translated in the King James Version of the Bible. Here's what the King James Version says. This is the way I memorize it, because when my dad had us memorize Scripture, we memorized out of the King James we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, for them who are the called according to His purpose. Now on the surface, if you just look at that, that seems to imply that everything that happens is a part of God's greater plan. That life is like a giant jigsaw puzzle that will make sense once all the other pieces are in place. It appears to say that given enough time, 
Everything that happens will prove to have been good or necessary. But that's an unfortunate translation of the verse. It may have been very accurate in the early 1600s. I don't know. I never spoke Shakespearean English. But I do know that language changes over time. 400 years ago, charity meant love. That's why the word charity is used in 1 Corinthians 13. But now charity means giving money to help people in need. 55 years ago, when I called somebody a dope, my parents would be upset with me. But when kids today call something dope, it's a high praise. It means that something is really, really good. So a more accurate reading of Romans 8.28 in modern English would be like this. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Notice the difference. It doesn't say that everything that happens is good. It simply says that God is at work in all things. In other words, even the enemy's best shot cannot thwart God's ultimate plan. God can and will accomplish His good purposes no matter what. But that's a far cry from saying that everything that happens is somehow good or necessary. Those who pin every disease or every financial disaster and betrayal on the direct action of God are headed down a logically indefensible path. I mean, if these things are really an expression of God's goodness, they would have shown up in the garden before the fall. They would surely play a prominent role in heaven where God's goodness and blessings reign supreme. Yet clearly, that's not the case. And notice something else about this verse that most people miss. This verse is not a promise for everyone. It's a promise for a specific kind of person. One who meets two important criteria. Paul says, the verse is for somebody who, one, loves God, and two, has been called according to His purpose. In Scripture, someone who loves God is also somebody who's seeking to obey Him. And someone who's been called according to His purpose means somebody who's a follower of Jesus Christ. So that leaves out a lot of people. Now, hear this. That doesn't mean that God doesn't love or care about people who don't yet love Him or haven't followed His call on their lives. I mean, Jesus said in the Gospels, God makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But this verse that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit isn't talking about everybody. He very specifically says that this promise is for those who love God and have been called by Him to a higher purpose. So it is not a universal truth that God is at work in all things, in every person's life, to bring about good purposes, even in bad circumstances. That promise is conditional to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So thinking about that, here is the beauty and promise of Romans 8.28. No matter how bad things may get, God's ultimate and eternal purpose will not be foiled in the life of somebody who loves Him. So don't blame God when bad things come across your path. Those who assume that everything that happens has God's fingerprints all over it fail to distinguish between what God allows and what God causes. What God permits and what God prefers. We have freedom. And there are three sources of pain specifically, that God does not cause. 
First thing is this, self-inflicted wounds of sinful choices. Sometimes the trials and hardships we face are the results of sinful choices we make. That's not God's doing. That's our doing. Secondly, life in a fallen world. Sometimes we're hurt by other people's sinful choices. Sometimes bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. To some degree, we're all caught in the backwash of Adam's sin in the garden. It's unavoidable. It's universal. I don't think it's coincidence that the first story in the Bible after the fall of Adam and Eve is the story of Cain and Abel, a bad guy killing a good guy. That's what happens in a fallen world. Bad people do bad things and good people get hurt. So any attempt to downplay the universal impact of the fall, or worse, the assumption that Christians have some sort of a magic bubble protection surrounding them, fails to square with Scripture. Or with life, for that matter. And it's a recipe for a disappointment with God. When it comes to the consequences of the fall, we are not offered immunity. We are offered eternity. And the third thing, the sources of pain that God does not cause is foolish decisions. Not sinful decisions, just unwise decisions, just dumb decisions. The great philosopher John Wayne once said, life is tough. Life is tougher when you're stupid. (laughs) Similar thought on Facebook. Everything happens for a reason, but sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and you make bad decisions. Picking the wrong stock can wipe out your portfolio. Picking the wrong business partner can cause your business to go down in flames. It is ludicrous to blame God or to assume that He'll jump in and fix every idiotic decision that you and I make. But here's the good news. The good news isn't that God promises to keep us from making bad decisions or to fix whatever we break. It's that He promises to continue working for our eternal good no matter what. No matter how many mistakes or bad choices, or even sinful choices we make. When we give people the idea that God directly causes everything in their lives, then we are not only doing them a great disservice, but we can also cause great spiritual harm. Because if that's what we say to people, it can cause people to be angry with God. We actually hand the enemy some ammo some powerful ammo to use in other people's lives. Ammo he will gladly use to slander God's reputation. His argument usually will go something like this as he speaks to the person. If God is responsible for your mess that you're in, he's obviously either not very good or not very powerful. Why waste your time following a God like that? So what exactly is the good news for us in Romans 8.28? I don't believe that God directly gives His children cancer. I don't believe God causes people to commit murder. I don't believe God's will is for someone to die in a car crash. But even in all these terrible occurrences, God has a way of forcing good to come from tragedy when we trust Him with it. As I look back on the most painful experiences in my life, I can see how God used them to bring about something good, even beautiful. In fact, the person I am today is largely the product of my most painful experiences. 
and what God did with them in me and through me. Somebody wrote the following words regarding suffering in our lives. Listen to this. This is so wise. They said this, suffering is not God's desire for us, but it occurs in the process of life. Suffering is not given to teach us something, but through it, we may learn. Suffering is not given to punish it, us, but sometimes it is the consequence of our sin or poor judgment. Suffering does not occur because our faith is weak, but through it, our faith may be strengthened. God does not depend on human suffering to achieve His purposes, but sometimes, through suffering, His purposes are achieved. Suffering can either destroy us, or it can add meaning to our life. End of quote. So here's the bottom line. God hasn't promised that everything will always work out in this life. But he has promised that no matter what happens, he will never leave us or forsake us. He has also promised that no matter what life or whatever the enemy may throw our way, his good and eternal purposes can never be thwarted. But please, let's stop calling the devil's best shot God's doing. Let's stop calling Adam's legacy God's handiwork. And let's stop calling evil good. As Christians, we recognize that sometimes horrible things happen. They are a part of life in a fallen and a broken world. But we also recognize, as Christians, that horrible things will never have the final word. Ultimately, they become part of our journey that finally reaches its end in God's eternal kingdom. And that's exactly what Jesus' resurrection shows us. The absolutely worst thing that could ever happen. Men taking the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, and nailing Him to a cross. The worst evil that ever happened. Jesus' resurrection shows us Death is not the end. Love outlasts it all. And God has the final word. As you've heard me say before, the worst thing that ever happens to us will never be the last thing. If we love God, and if we're called according to His purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that when things happen we don't understand, to me it's comforting at least to know that you're not the direct cause of every bad thing that goes on in our life. Um, you permit things, but even the things you permit, Lord, you can use to bring something good, to bring something beautiful even out of our lives. And help us to know that you're with us every step of the way. Just like the psalmist said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Thank you for that abiding, continual presence that helps us when we do have to go through the bad things in life. And we can still believe in a good God in the midst of all of it. And that you will actually even bring something good out of it. We offer it back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.